Hi. I'm, Hi. I mean, good evening. <laughs> um, welcome, and thanks for coming out in the rain for this occasion. Um, great. Awkward. Um, I want to start by thanking the Kelly Writers House and the Center for Africana Studies for helping me realize my vision for tonight's fellowship, and to you all for showing up to honor the immense force that became an ancestor this past August. Ashe. Um, it is no secret and it is no debate or coincidence that we're here together to celebrate the greatest American novelist to ever live. There will never be another writer like Toni Morrison. What a lush and fruitful life she so generously shared with us. What a pristine model for how to walk through the world. I won't be long because if Miss Tony taught us anything, it's that she can speak for herself. But I called us here tonight to linger in the gift that Morrison left us, that which will never die, her words. At 88, Morrison had authored a titanic corpus, I mean, shit. <laughs> corpus. <laughs> Um, now I lost my place. From the 10 novels, um, which the center so generously provided for display, Bob, uh, to countless essays, speeches, plays, even children's literature. She for the kids, y'all. She, she really is. Um, regardless of field, Miss Tony did language, as she would say. She rolled up her sleeves and decided to be too undeniable not to be seen. And for once, the world listened and listened closely. Morrison's now canonized masterpiece, Beloved, is one of the most widely read novels published in the 20th century. Honestly, I, I just want us to sit in that knowledge for a second. Um, a black woman wrote a neo-slave narrative novel about how the history of American enslavement lives within the body, and the world said, yeah, this is what we need to be reading, and this is what we need to be hearing and listening to. Um, who else, who else could have done that? I mean, geez. I'm, I know I sound in awe, but I really, truly am, still even in her wake. Um, who else could have written their first novel every morning at 4 a.m. while raising two children on their own and have that first novel be the bluest eye? <laughs> um, I could go on, but what I ask us to consider tonight is the remarkably singular nature of Morrison's journey. Um, we were lucky enough and wise enough to give her her flowers while she was still here, but our job now and our responsibility now is to not stop watering them to keep reading her, keep teaching her, keep recommending her, and make sure that her work stays where it is and where it needs to be with us at all times. Um, I now want to open up the space if anyone else feels called to speak a little bit about how Morrison has impacted their personal life or journey. I want it to be a communal space because that's something that she really valued and values. I'm going to sit down now. Hey. Okay. So, um, what do I want to say? So, I came across Toni Morrison before I knew who she was exactly. I was, I think I was looking for a book to read maybe when I was like 13 or something like that. And I came across this quote and it stuck with me and the language was beautiful and it was so intentionally written. Uh, and I later realized that this was the case with all of her work yeah. but this specific passage stuck with me the most and it's this from the scene in um, Beloved when baby Suggs is in a clearing and she's sort of giving a, a sermon of sorts uh, to everyone there and it was just it resonated with me I felt very um, recognized and and appreciated so I'm gonna read from that yeah. here she said in this place we flesh flesh that weeps laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass, love it, love it hard. Yonder, they do not know your flesh, they despise it. They don't love your eyes, they just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back, yonder they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands, those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands, love them, raise them up, and kiss them touch others with them, pat them together, stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You got to love it. You, that's the part. Like, what? It's just, uh, <laughs> it's so profound. Um, and no, they, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. What you put in, into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leave-ins instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. 
This is flesh I'm talking about here, flesh that needs to be loved, feet that need to rest and to dance, back that needs support, shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people out yonder, hear me, they do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck, put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs, you gotta love them. The dark, dark liver, love it, love it. And the beat and beating heart, love that too. More than eyes or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air more than your life holding womb and your life giving private parts hear me now love your heart for this is the prize mm. period thank you Imani and Ashley for putting this together. Gail Garrison and I, as the directors of the Center for African Studies, are so, so glad to be a part of this. I want to say what Imani said earlier. Isn't it so wonderful that we can truly say, and I mean the we in the fullest sense, right? Everybody who loved Toni Morrison, we can fully say and know. Yamani, as you said, that we gave her her flowers while she was alive, and that, that matters so much to me. Uh, Imani, you said when we met that you want to bring the warmth into this gathering. So I, because there's, I, I can't, I think like many of us, I can't pick a favorite passage written by Toni Morris, and that's impossible, but I can ask myself what might be the warmest passage. And then I think it's the end of jazz. So I want to read that. <sighs> that I have loved only you, surrendered my whole self, reckless to you and nobody else. That I want you to love me back and show it to me. That I love the way you hold me, how close you let me be to you. I like your fingers on and on, lifting, turning. I have watched your face for a long time now and missed your eyes. I miss her eyes when you went away from me. Talking to you and hearing you answer, that's the kick. But I can't say that aloud. I can't tell anyone that I have been waiting for this all my life and that being chosen to wait is the reason I can. If I were able, I'd say it, say make me, remake me, she made us, she remade us. You are free to do it and I'm free to let you because look, look where your hands are now on her precious body of literature. Thank you, Toni Morris. Good evening, everyone. I too want to thank Amani and Ashley for taking the initiative to put this together, and to my colleagues at the Center for Africana Studies, Gail and Margot Crawford. Um, this is why we do what we do. So um, I met Toni Morrison when I was 19 years old uh, for the first time, and she had just won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Song of Solomon which um, was a book that I had bought, but started three times and, and stopped at page 42 each time. But I, I decided to take the book home with me for Christmas break, and my life was changed. Um, <clears throat> I have lots of favorite scenes from Toni Morrison, but this is because this was the first Toni Morrison novel that I read. It's the one that stands out in my mind. So this takes place in Song of Solomon, and it takes place in a barbershop. And you'll see in a moment uh, why uh, Morrison is such a, uh, a gifted writer, because she breathes life into these black men in this barbershop. 
um, in ways that at that point in time in my life I had not seen. <clears throat> Silently, they ambled down 10th Street until they reached a stone bench that jutted from the sidewalk near the curb. They stopped there and sat down, their backs to the eyes of two men in white smocks who were watching them. One of the men leaned in the doorway of a barber shop. The other sat in a chair, tilted back to the plate glass window of the shop. They were the owners of the barber shop, Railroad Tommy and Hospital Tommy. Neither boy spoke nor to the men nor to each other. They sat and watched the traffic go by. Have all the halls of academe crumbled, guitar? Hospital Tommy spoke from his chair. His eyes were milky, like those of very old people, but the rest of him was firm, lithe, and young looking. His tone was casual, but suggested authority nonetheless. No, sir, guitar answered him over his shoulder. Then what, pray, are you doing out here in the streets at this time of day? Guitar shrugged. We just took a day off, Mr. Tommy. And your companion, is he on sabbatical too? Guitar nodded. Hospital Tommy talked like an encyclopedia, and Guitar had to guess at most of his words. Milkman kept looking at the cars going by. Neither one of you appears to be having much fun on your holiday. You could have stayed in the halls of academe and looked evil. <laughs> Guitar fished for a cigarette and offered one to Milkman. Feather made me mad is all. Feather? Yeah, he wouldn't let us in. I go in there all the time, all the time, and he don't say nothing. But today he throws us out. Said my friend here is too young. Can you beat that, Feather? Worrying about somebody's age? I didn't know Feather had so much as a brain cell to worry with. He don't, just showing off is all. He wouldn't even let me have a bottle of beer. Railroad Tommy laughed softly from the doorway. Is that all? He wouldn't let you have a beer? He rubbed the back of his neck, then crooked a, fring cook crooked a finger at guitar. Come over here, boy, and let me tell you about some other stuff you are not going to have. Come on over here. Reluctantly, they stood up and sidled closer to the laughing man. You think that's something, not having a beer? Well, let me ask you something. You ever stood stock still in the galley of the Baltimore and Ohio dining car in the middle of the night when the kitchen closed down and everything's neat and ready for the next day? And the engine's highballing down the track and three of your buddies is waiting for you with a brand new deck of cards? Guitar shook his head. No, I never. That's right, you never. And you're never going to. That's one more thrill you're not going to have, let alone a bottle of beer. Guitar smiled. Mr. Tommy, he began, but Tommy cut him off. You ever pull 14 days straight and come home to a sweet woman clean sheets and a fifth of wild turkey, eh? He looked at Milkman. Did you? Milkman smiled and said, no, sir. No? Well, don't look forward to it, because you're not going to have that either. Hospital Tommy took a, drew a pen feather toothpick from under his smock. Don't tease the boy, Tommy. Who's teasing? I'm telling him the truth. He ain't going to have it. Neither one of them going to have it. And I'll tell you something else you're not going to have. You're not going to have no private coach with four red velvet chairs that swivel around in one place whenever you want them to. No. And you're not going to have your own special toilet and your own special made eight foot bed either and a valet, and a cook, and a secretary to travel with you and do everything you say? Everything. Get the right temperature in your hot water bottle and make sure the smoking tobacco in the silver humidor is fresh each and every day. That's something you're not going to have. You ever have $5,000 of cold cash money in your pocket and walk into a bank and tell the bank man you want such and such a house on such and such a street and he sell it to you right then? Well, you won't ever have it. And you're not going to have a governor's mansion or 8,000 acres of timber to sell. And you're not going to have no ship under your command to sail, no, sail on, no train to run. And you can join the 332nd if you want to and shoot down 1,000 German planes all by yourself and land in Hitler's backyard and whip them with your own hands. But you're never going to have four stars on your shirt front or even three. And you're not going to have no breakfast tray brought into you early in the morning with a red rose on it and two warm croissants and a cup of hot chocolate? Nope, never. And no pheasant buried in coconut leaves for 20 days and stuffed with wild rice and cooked over a wildfire so tender and delicate it make you cry? And no Rothschild 29 or even Beaujolais to go with it? A few men passing by stopped to listen to Tommy's lecture. What's going on, they asked Hospital Tommy. Feather refused him a beer, he said. The men laughed. And no baked Alaska! Railroad Tommy went on. None. You're never going to have that. No baked Alaska? Guitar opened his eyes wide with horror and grabbed his throat. You breaking my heart. 
Well, now, that's something you will have, a broken heart. Railroad Tommy's eyes softened, but the merriment in them died suddenly. And folly, a whole lot of folly. You can count on it. Mr. Tommy, sir, guitar sang in mock humility. We just wanted a bottle of beer is all. Yeah, said Tommy. Yeah, well, welcome aboard. Thanks to everyone who got up and talked a little bit. That was really nice. I don't know. Um, for the next portion of the evening, um, in the spirit of like communal creation and stuff, um, we're going to watch a short segment of the Morrison documentary that debuted this summer. And then you'll see the documentary begins with collaging. And I think that a lot of Morrison's work kind of worked as a collage of black culture, a representation not a pro not proving black humanity, but instead dwelling in it. Um, and I'm thinking about what it means to dwell in different, the varied instances and instantiations of blackness. So in that spirit, it, as they make a collage of Miss Morrison um, in the documentary, we have some craft materials and portraits of Toni Morrison. So everyone, if you want, can make a little poster of her to take home with you. So um, we're gonna.